Hello Ice and Fire Nerds, this is Chris and this is going to be my Game of Thrones Season 6 Episode 10, The Winds of Winter Breakdown and Review. And holy shit, what a fucking episode. We got everything we could ask for. Had so many payoffs and loose ends wrapped up as far as all the previous seasons combined. So this has to go down as one of my all-time favorite episodes. Definitely the best finale I've ever seen, but probably right up there in the top two or three episodes of all time for me. We got the big reveal with Jon Snow. We got Danny finally heading to Westeros after all these years. We had Cersei going full dark side. And poor old King Tom. I guess he didn't even stick that landing. This episode was directed by Miguel Sampochnik, the guy who directed the last episode, The Battle of the Bastards, as well as episodes like Hard Home, so I think he just needs to direct them all. But let's jump right in because there's a lot of shit going on in this episode and a lot of small little detailed things I want to talk about as well. I will say in the opening credits, we did see the Stark sigil on Winterfell again, which is kind of cool. We hadn't saw that in quite a few seasons. The Boltons are now wiped out completely. But anyway, we start in King's Landing, and as I said in last week's preview video, Cersei looked like she was dressing for a funeral, and damn sure she was. And the opening of this episode really pays homage to how well this production is because there wasn't any dialogue in the first few minutes, only people getting dressed, and the music alone built that suspense. We saw Cersei getting dressed, we saw Marjorie getting her hair did, we saw Tommy getting dressed and getting his crown on, getting ready for their day, the High Sparrow included. And this damn dress that Cersei got dressed up in to get ready for her big day was pretty damn badass with the shoulder armor. She looked like a damn Sith Lord. Hell, her in this dress reminded me of the Cenobite pinhead from Hellraiser. The box. You opened it. We came. We hear the bells tolling. We know that's not a good sign. Everybody piles into the Sept of Baylor for the trial. Loris is brought in, but there's not even going to be a trial because he basically admits to all his sins and decides to join the faith. After he confesses everything and says he'll give his life to the faith, they immediately whip out a blade and carve him a forehead tattoo. And I was always wondering why the High Sparrow didn't get one. Isn't that desecration of your temple or something like that? Anyway, Cersei's not showing up or the king, and Marjorie is noticing and people are getting worried about it, so the High Sparrow sends Lancel to go get Cersei. So Lancel walks outside, apparently to head up to get Cersei and bring her to the trial, although I don't know how that was going to happen with Franken mounting around. We saw what happened to that dude the last time Lancel tried to make Cersei do something she didn't want to do. But anyway, he sees a little bird running under the Sept of Baylor down in some catacombs, I suppose, and he decides to make chase for suspense and goes down and finds all the wildfire we had seen in the previous episodes. This was directly from Bran's vision. This is one of the caches the Mad King Ares had left under the Sept of Baylor. Anyway, the little bird comes up and shanks Lancel. He goes down and apparently he's paralyzed because he starts dragging himself towards what he sees on the ground up ahead of him, which happens to be predator blood. I'm sorry, wildfire with fucking tea light candles placed on top of it. So they had essentially set up a time bomb here. I thought this was really, really cool. They essentially had a fuse on the thing via the candle. And by the time Lancel gets up close to it to try to blow it out or stop it or whatever. <laughs> I mean, this motherfucker goes up. This was the best damn CGI explosion I've ever seen. What was really cool is Marjorie and them trying to get out. She knows something's wrong. She tries to convince the High Sparrow that. And at just the last minute, the High Sparrow realizes Marjorie's right and something's wrong. And you can see the damn old shit look on his face. So the High Sparrow and hundreds of other people get incinerated instantly. So you had the High Sparrow, Marjorie, Loras, Kevin Lannister, Mace Tyrell, all the other little Sparrow fuckers. So House Tyrell is essentially wiped off the fucking map. This is very similar to what the Lannisters did to the reigns of Castamere, which is where the song comes from, and Cersei pours herself a glass of Dornish Red and watches all this shit go down like, what? I told you. But what she didn't count on was Tom and saw all this go down as well, and he knew that Marjorie, his love, and queen was in there along with his newfound faith, so he decides, you know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna put my crown away, and I'm gonna take a swan dive out the fucking window. So that fulfills the show prophecy anyway, and she has no more children left. So she's going to go full batshit insane now. She is truly the Mad Queen. She is the perfect villain now. She's always been an asshole, but now she's the perfect villain in black. And she had captured the Septa as well. She promised her. And what's really interesting here, as she brings in Frankenmount to start torturing the Septa, because she promised her she was the last thing she was going to see as she died slow. Sir Gregor Clegane, Frankenmountain, Sir Robert Strong, whatever you want to call him, actually takes off his helmet. Now, there's always been a lot of speculation going on in the books about 
about who he is under that helmet. Because in the books, the mountain's head was actually sent to Dorne, apparently, to Dorne Martell to prove that the mountain was dead since they did want revenge on the mountain. That's what Oberyn went to King's Landing for in the first place. But it's never really proven whose head that is, so there's a lot of speculation about is there a head under there at all? Is it somebody else's head? And it's always been interesting to me that they named him Sir Robert Strong. And if you look here at this scene at just the right angle, and I'll try to lighten this up a little bit, this looks to be like Robert Baratheon's head without a beard. Here's a picture of the actor that plays Robert Baratheon without a beard next to the picture of Frankenmountain as he kind of walks into the light. The timelines don't really work out for this. I'm not saying this is Robert Baratheon. There's also a lot of speculation that could be Rob Stark's head. The timelines don't fit because Robert died long before Kybern ever got to King's Landing, long before the mountain ever died in the trial by combat that Tyrion had. But it's very interesting to me why they named him Sir Robert Strong in the first place. So I'm not saying this is definitely who this is, but this is definitely suspect even though the timelines really don't work out as far as a rotting corpse. But this to me looks like Robert Baratheon's head. So again, I'm not sure how that would go down if that's the case. I'm not sure how they would preserve that head. Robert Baratheon's remains were apparently sent back to Storm's Inn instead of buried with the rest of the kings because he wanted to be sent back there as his final resting place. So again, the timelines don't really match up for this being Robert Baratheon's head, but it damn sure looks like it. So then we head to the twins in the Riverlands and Walter Frey is celebrating his big victory to get Riverrun back, although Jamie did all the work. And Jamie basically tells his ass off by saying, you know what, every time you lose something, if we have to come down here and take it back for you, what the hell do we need you for? And then we go right back to King's Landing and Cersei is realizing the error of her ways as far as her children goes, but this time she's stone cold and she doesn't even mourn Tommen. She's a stone cold killer now and she has his body burned so he can be with the rest of his family. And then we go over to Old Town and yes, we finally get to see Old Town and the Citadel. It looks really gorgeous here. The CGI backdrop. We see all the white ravens going out to announce winter is here to all the houses of the realm. We see Sam and Gilly getting off the wagon. He goes in a very awkward check-in like he's trying to check into a Motel 6 but he didn't have reservations. But basically after a little bit of comedy here he gets accepted and is told to go wait in the library and he walks in and this is some Harry Potter looking shit right here. This library was fucking beautiful which is some words I never thought I'd say. But anyway, Sam, you got a lot of fucking books to read. And then we go to Winterfell, and John is talking to Melisandre. Davos walks in the room, and he is pissed off. He throws the damn stag that he had carved for Shireen, and Davos makes Melisandre tell John what she did to Shireen. My little bit of beef with this scene here with Davos is, while I completely understand this was an evil thing to do in his eyes, she did this under Stannis' orders. I said this before, yes, she suggested it because there was nothing left to do. He was stuck in the snow. She believed Stannis was Azor Ahai, and she did suggest the burning of Shireen, but Stannis and Solis, for that matter, both said go for it. So while Davos is mad for Melisandre for using this blood magic, but yet he went to Melisandre to ask her to use magic to bring Jon Snow back, but now he's mad again because she used magic before on Shireen. Now again, obviously this is a horrible thing to do. I hated to see that scene when it happened last year, but the point being that she believes that she's doing the right thing for the realm for everybody's lives and believes these sacrifices are a good thing in the sense of the bigger picture. Anyway, Jon's kind of in a bad spot here because this is the chick that brought him back to life and he kind of sees that he is special in some way, although he's not really sure what that is yet. So anyway, he says, you know what? Ride south and never come back or I'll have you hang. Dabo steps in the way and says, if I ever see you again, I'll execute you myself. So he wanted her head here. Now, a lot of people had speculated that John may actually execute her and that would be the whole thing where he uses long claw to cut her head off or stab it through her or whatever to execute her and then it would potentially catch long claw on fire and it would become Lightbringer, the mystical Azor High blade that apparently burns. But I've also said in many many videos of mine that I don't believe that Lightbringer is a literal sword on fire. I believe that the red sword Lightbringer only means a Valyrian steel sword because supposedly that's how they were forged in old Valyria. But anyway, Melisandre does have to live a little while longer. She said in a previous season when she met Arya with the Brotherhood Without Banners that there's a darkness in you. We will meet again. So I'm assuming next season we'll see her in the area of the Riverlands perhaps or as the Brotherhood Without Banners marches north and Arya's storyline might be tied into theirs as she heads north towards Winterfell. But then we go to John and Sansa on the battlements of Winterfell looking over at all the snow and they have a little chit chat and she apologizes for not telling John about the army of the Vale. Now a lot of people were arguing last week or debating I should say on whether Sansa really knew what was going on or whether she really you know hid this information from John but she apologized herself so yes yeah, she admitted that she was wrong in that sense for not trusting him so they have a little heart to heart moment but he does bring up Littlefinger and how he basically sold Sansa to the Boltons and 
and how can she trust him? And she says, nobody in her right mind trusts Littlefinger. So that'll definitely be a little bit of a conflict going on later for sure between John and Sansa. But she does bring up, you know what? We got a white raven from the Citadel. Winter is here. And this was kind of a cool scene between these two because John kind of laughs and says, well, father always promised. And then we head down to Dorne. Yes, Dorne is still in the show. And Illyria Sand and the Sand Snakes are talking to Lady Olana. So apparently a lot of time has passed because she knows about the burning of King's Landing. She knows about Cersei and what she did to Marjorie and Mace and her entire family. Now what's cool here is Lady Olana, the Queen of Thorns, actually gives a little book shout out here, a little reference to some history in A Song of Ice and Fire when she says that the last time a Tyrell came down here he got murdered by what, a hundred red scorpions? Referring to the fact that in history the first time that Dorne was actually conquered by the Targaryens, Darren the first Targaryen sent Lionel Tyrell down to Dorne to conquer it for him and this was called the Conquest of Dorne and he did succeed but basically as the story goes down it was hard to keep the Dornishmen under control. They were always looking to rebel. He kept moving from place to place and finally one night he climbed into bed somewhere where he had relocated once again and there were a hundred red scorpions in the bed that actually killed him. So basically at that point the Targaryens lost everything they had gained in the first conquering of Dorne. So I thought that was a pretty cool book shout out there. Little history lesson. Anyway, Elena and Illyria basically discuss how they want revenge. She don't even care about the family anymore. The family's wiped out. She just wants vengeance on Cersei. And Illyria says, I can provide you all your heart's content. And I'd said this in a few videos before that Varys was going to head to Dorne to set up an alliance between Danny and the Dornish. And we got that hint from Illyria Sand earlier in the season when she told Dorne as she shanked his ass to death in the heart that no weak man would ever rule Dorne again. So as Illyria is asking her what she wants and she says vengeance, Varys walks out and says fire and blood. So now we have an official alliance set up between Daenerys and Dorne. And of course, she's already got an alliance with half of the Greyjoys as well. So then we head to Marine, and Danny basically breaks up with Dario. Poor Dario. He says that he loves her. Please take me with you. And she's like, no, I can't take you with me. You need to stay here and look over the city as they elect new leaders. So this is indicating that there's some kind of democracy taking hold. She has now conquered the entire Slaver's Bay, which she has renamed Dragon's Bay, by the way. And Dario is there with the Second Sons to keep the peace while they elect their new leaders. They did say leaders in plural not leader. So this is to me is kind of hinting at some things I mentioned last week in the Q&A about a potential change in the style of ruling that's going on in this world. Perhaps a democratic style government. Anyway, after the big breakup scene, Danny goes out and talks to Tyrion and this was a great scene between these two. Tyrion is the one who suggested that she leave Dario behind because she couldn't be seen as the new queen of Westeros with some side piece boy toy. You realize that Tyrion has completely earned her trust. They have a good exchange here about him really believing in her and he's never really believed in anything in his life except for women and booze, of course. Tyrion gives his great game speech about the great game is terrifying that we saw in the trailer. So as they talk about the breakup of Dario, and Tyrion says something to the effect of he won't be the last man to love you, Tyrion really looks at her with some, some eyes there, like he's catching some feelings for Danny. But just like the scene with Dario when he says, who will you marry? She says, I don't know. That could be setting up some certain, you know, king of the north. Anyway, in this very cool scene, Danny shows that she truly believes in Tyrion and all his counsel, pulls out a pen and makes him hand of the queen. Tyrion then almost damn near cries and goes to his knees. He truly believes in her and who she is and what she's about. And this was a very, very cool scene. I really love this dialogue between these two. They really became close here. And Tyrion is now back in a position like he was as hand of the king at King's Landing while his father was away, but now this is something he truly believes in, so I think this is a very, very cool storyline here. And yeah, he's digging Danny now. I think he wants to ride the dragon. So then we head back to the twins, and my god, this was fucking fantastic. The suspicious serving girl that we saw in the previous scene comes up to serve Walter Frey some pie. And we got some damn Frey pie, people! This was actually Wyman Manderley in the books who set up the Frey pie thing, but this went down a little bit differently. We did see him later in Winterfell when Jon was proclaimed King of the North. But anyway, Walter Frey says, where the hell are my sons? Because Blackwater and Lothar were missing, apparently, just like in the books. And the serving girl says, they're here. They're right here. And then she starts saying, it was kind of tough, Carl them up and he starts to freak the fuck out. You see a damn finger up in the pie he's been eating. She takes off her fucking face here and she says the last thing you're ever going to see is a Stark smiling down at you and cuts his fucking throat. This is apparently her signature go-to move but she can sit there and just laugh about it and that's kind of a dark place for Arya. So to me this kind of helps out with the whole faceless man situation that we kind of got confused about a few episodes back when it seemed like it was pointless for her to be over there in the first place. But if you remember back in season three when Jacken leaves to go to Bravos and invites Arya to come over and become a 
a faceless assassin to join the House of Black and White before she knew what it was. He does say you have a lot of names on your list and I can help you get them off of your list. So basically the way I take that is that Jack and knew this all along. This kind of explains his nod of approval the last time we saw Arya. She walked off in the House of Black and White and said, I'm Arya Stark of Winterfell and I'm going home. So Jack and essentially said, you know what? I like this kid. She's got potential and in the book she's also a warg and invited her over there to train her up so she could send every name on her list to the many-faced god which is who Jack and serves. As long as these people are given the gift, he just provided her the tools to do that. So that makes me feel a little bit better about the whole Arya Faceless Man situation. But yeah, we got some damn fray pie. Honestly, I didn't see that actually coming in the show. And then we head back to Winterfell and Littlefinger and Sansa start talking in the Godswood. Sansa basically asks Littlefinger, what the hell do you want? And he basically tells us his end game here. He says he has this picture in mind of him sitting on the Iron Throne and Sansa beside him. So she stops him from giving her another kiss and says, that's a pretty picture. But as she walks off, he kind of plants a seed of doubt and says, you know what? Who should the North rally behind? You, the true-born daughter of Ned Stark, or some bastard brother of yours? So this basically plants a seed for him to be basically the villain in the North right now until the Night King shows up of course. So this will set up some tension later between John and Sansa. So then we head to the Haunted Forest just north of the wall and Benjen slash Cold Hands is with Bran and Mira and he basically drops them off and confirms that he cannot pass through the wall. Just like in the books Cold Hands cannot pass through the wall because he does say the wall was built with not only ice but magic and warding spells and he doesn't even leave the damn horse and he don't have a sled for her to pull either. Damn Benjen leave him the damn horse. He wishes him good fortune and says he'll do what he can because he still fights for the living north of the wall. So Bran and pulls himself over to the weirwood tree and right before he's about to touch it and go into his visions, Mira says, are you sure you're ready? And Bran shows a lot more confidence here than he did the last episode saying, yeah, I have to be ready. I'm the three-eyed crow now. So he touches the tree and goes straight back to the Tower of Joy where we left off last time when he was with Blood Raven. And of course, he had already changed this little piece of the past because Ned still turns his head where Bran had previously shouted, Father. So Ned heads into the Tower of Joy, walks into the room, and we see Lyanna in a bed of blood, and we see two handmaidens as well. And I'm assuming that one of these is probably Wyla, the wet nurse. And that, of course, is who Ned told Robert in Season 1 who John's mother was, and he wasn't going to talk about her. What's pretty cool here is Ned lays down Dawn, the sword that we saw from Sir Arthur Dane the previous Tower of Joy battle scene. He lays it down at the foot of the bed, goes over to Lyanna as she's dying. She obviously doesn't want to die. She says she's afraid. She's trying to be tough. So then we get to see the infamous scene that we all pictured when Lyanna says, promise me Ned. But in the show here, she did say a little bit more and we could hear a few things. The things we did hear, his name is, and then the audio went out. We did hear, if Robert finds out, he'll kill him. And we also heard, you have to protect him. Promise me, Ned. Promise me. Now the interesting thing here is when she says his name, I was trying to actually try to lip read a little bit because the audio went out. She did not say his name is John. I had actually mentioned this a few weeks ago to a couple people in the comments and to some personal friends discussing theories that I don't think Jon Snow's real name is John. I had compared it to Jon Snow, John Doe, as in an unidentified person, just a made up name. Although I could be completely wrong, but it didn't look like to me she said his name is John. It looked like to me with my amateur lip reading skills that she used a vowel, as in Aegon. Now I'm not saying that's exactly what she said, but to me again, it just didn't look like she said his name is John, as in you would see her mouth pronounce the letter J, as far as the way her lips were moving. So obviously this is just speculation, but I'm thinking here, even though Rhaegar previously had a son named Aegon, he was already dead at this point because the mountain had already came in and killed him, so Supposedly, he still may be alive in the books, but doubtful. So I think he may actually have a Targaryen name, whether that's Aegon, something Targaryen-like, because Jon Snow is very similar to Jon Doe in real life, and I think that may be the name that Ned kind of picked for him to kind of help hide the fact of who he was. But anyway, this was a great scene. It went off exactly like it should have. I mean, everything we expected from this. We didn't get this much in the books as far as the Tower of Joy at all. We certainly hadn't got the reveal yet anyway. And this sets up our next scene because we did see the baby, Jon Snow. He looks down at Jon as Lyanna continued to say, promise me, Ned, promise me you'll look after him, promise me you'll take care of him, promise me you'll keep his identity secret. And we see the shot of the baby, his eyes open, and it immediately cuts over to a current Jon Snow in Winterfell. So RLJ is fucking confirmed. No more R plus L equals D, or J and D, or J and M is confirmed. And I think this is going to go down in the books exactly the same way. Something this big cannot be really different in the books. They're going to diverge a lot, obviously, because of the material is not there yet for the show. The main points will be there, the main plot points, and will also arrive at basically the same ending. So then, of course, as I mentioned, Baby John fades into current John in Winterfell, and they are at the table with all the Northern Lords now seated in the hall with Sansa. Initially, all the Northern Lords are like, the battle's won, their Boltons are gone, we're all here now, we gotta hunker down for the winter. And John's like, oh, hell no, the motherfucker is coming? He don't hunker down for winter, he brings the storm. 
And then another one of my favorite scenes of this episode, Lyanna Mormont, this little badass chick, stands up and calls out these other Northern Lords, Glover, Manderley, and Kerwin, about not answering the call when it was time. And she says, House Mormont answered the call, and we know no king but the king in the north, and his name is John fucking Snow. She don't care that he's a bastard. Then, of course, all the Northern Lords fall in line and pull out their swords, swear fealty to John, proclaim him king of the north. Very similar to the scene in a previous season when Rob was proclaimed king of the north. John looks a bit shocked here. He looks down at Sansa. She starts smiling. She seems very happy for him. But then she looks over at Littlefinger and he's kind of still playing her and she looks a little worried now because this is exactly what she told him in the Godswood at Winterfell before this happened. Who are we supposed to swear fealty to? You, the Trueborn Stark, or Jon Snow, your bastard brother? Of course we know that's not the case. But they don't know that now. Kind of like I said, this would be a cliffhanger in the sense that Jon wouldn't find out his parents is this episode. So Jon is the king of the fucking north, but there is going to be some drama between him and Sansa because she felt like she's not getting some of the credit there for for the battle, what have you, even though John and Sansa had already discussed this, so this will set up Littlefinger again as the villain in the North, but hopefully it doesn't go down some dark, weird path when winter is actually coming. So then we head back to King's Landing and Jamie shows up and he is like, what the fuck is going on? He sees all the smoke coming up from the former Sept of Baylor. Cersei had just left Tommen's body, not even stopping to mourn him for a second. She is truly the dark, evil Disney queen now, and she's proclaimed by Kyburn, Queen Cersei Lannister, first of her name. This is what she's been wanting the entire time. There's been a lot of hinting and foreshadowing about how men rule the world, etc., and how she don't understand that, but she has her brains, although she's not really as smart as she thinks she is. But this did obviously work out for her. Val and I had predicted in one of our prediction videos about Cersei that she would have one more victory before she goes out, although it cost her everything. She is now the queen, she sits on the Iron Throne, but she has lost everything in the process, all her children, and now Jamie walks in and sees that. You can see the concern on his face. So for Jamie, in his mind, the way he was looking, it's breakup time. And then finally we go to the Narrow Sea, or somewhere in Dragon's Bay, perhaps, and we see this huge fleet of Targaryen and Ironborn ships finally heading to Westeros. And if you look closely here, you all also see House Martell as well as House Tyrell. So Danny now has official alliances with half of the Ironborn fleet. House Martell and House Tyrell, what's left of them anyway. After 19 or so years of book stuff, we finally see Danny heading the fuck home. This was a beautiful end shot with beautiful music, and oddly enough, Varys is back already, and this kind of puts down the rumors about Varys really being the harpy or somehow against Danny. He has been with her since day one. We just have to assume here that a lot of time has passed because obviously he had enough time to get to Dorne, set up that alliance between Danny and the Martells in Dorne, and then get all the way back to Marine to then get on the boats to head back. Back over to Westeros with Danny and probably land in Dorne. So you just kind of got to ignore all that time travel shit. Now I will say here, this was no accident that this was the last shot right after Queen Cersei was crowned. We see Danny, the Queen and Marine headed over to Westeros. This was no accident. This was set up. We're going to see a showdown at some point as Danny lands in the south and heads north. She will have to cross paths with Cersei. And this is going to be one hell of a battle if there is a battle at all. Fire and fucking blood. So this episode was fucking outstanding. It was awesome. Everything was put together well. There were a few time travel issues like I mentioned, but other than that, it was everything we needed to see. Everything was wrapped up nice and clean. It set up season seven very well. Everything was done great. The music, the cinematography. Again, the director, Miguel, has done a great job with these episodes. I think he should probably direct the rest of the damn series. But we got a lot of payoff in this episode. We got Arya coming home. She's back in the game again. She's taking out people on her list, although that's a very dark path for her. We'll see where that ends up with her finally reuniting with Jon and Sansa eventually. We got the big payoff, R plus L equals J. That is confirmed. There's no more question about it. We got Cersei now, who is the Queen Bee. She is the best damn villain on the show, but she has gone full-fledged dark side Hellraiser. We'll tear your soul apart. And she is the perfect villain, the evil queen versus the good queen is the way it's being set up. It was very dark in there. You can see that was being set up and immediately went over to the nice, bright shot of Danny coming over with all these hundreds of ships and dragons, Targaryen banners as well. This episode was outstanding. It was probably my favorite ever just because of all the payoffs because we've been seeing all the foreshadowing and all the hints from season one and a lot of this really paid off in season six and especially this episode the wins of winter so anyway guys that's all i had i will be doing another q a this week with james to so please leave your questions in the comments below i will continue q a's and other game of thrones videos in the off season so let me know in the comments as well what kind of videos you would like to see since we have another year till season seven comes on would you like to see some history style videos some book related stuff theory related stuff whatever let me know what you think 
anything, give me your suggestions. I do have a little list of things and a couple ideas I want to do. I'll also be getting back more into some Star Wars stuff as it comes up. Of course, The Walking Dead starts in the fall. Or would you guys like to see some stuff like Game of Thrones Season 7 filming news and speculations? That starts to trickle out in the next few weeks because they are already going to begin filming fairly soon here. So we will start getting Season 7 leaks and spoilers. If you guys are interested in that, I'll be glad to do some of that stuff as well. Let me know what you think about this episode, guys. How was it for you? Was it the best episode ever? The best finale ever? Both. Anyway, guys, as usual, thank you for all the support. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. Be sure to give me a like as well if you dig what I do here. Be sure to share. Thank you for all the support, especially you guys on Patreon. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for watching, you guys, and we'll see you next time.